So now we are going to uh, seamlessly transition to the poster session in which we have uh, six uh, exciting papers. So we'll start with a round of uh, snap five minute presentations from each of the authors. Uh, and afterwards, uh, we will break up into um, parallel uh, rooms um, for, for continued discussion. Uh, and, uh, and so th these rooms uh, will also then uh, uh, be include the authors from the parallel sessions just ended. So if you want to talk to uh, Milo or Rosen or, um, or Archi, um, then uh, also please, uh, please stick around. Um, so uh, we'll proceed in uh, alphabetic fashion. Uh, so our first presenter will be uh, Fatima Aramian from Stockholm Business School. So please, Fatima, the screen is yours for the next five minutes. Okay, thank you. Is it uh, Yes, I can see that. Okay. Okay, thank you, Michelle, for the accepting the paper and hello, everyone. The paper I'm presenting here today called High Frequency Traders and uh, Single Dealer Platforms called uh, co-authored by Lars Nordia. High Frequency Traders, oh, just sorry, is there something here? High frequency traders or HFTs are a type of trader that has attracted a lot of attention from both regulators and researchers during the last decades. They are prop trading firms with uh, characteristics like uh, having high speed and sophisticated computers program uh, for their trading activities, having short investment horizon and keeping tight inventories. In the In 2018, the promotion of dealer platforms in the form of systematic internalizers or SIs uh, by the regulatory reform of MIFID II led to the emergence of HFT dealer platforms in Europe. In fact, SIs are defined as a dealer platforms run by investment firms that trade out of their own inventories by internalizing orders of exchanges. With this operation in place, HFTs run their own trading venues, act as a dealer, and conduct bilateral trading. HFT literature so far has mainly focused on their activities, the strategies, and their impact on equity market, uh, mainly in uh, multilateral trading-based venues like public stock exchanges. Motivated by this, and also motivated by the significant increase in a size market share in 2018 and the concern that is uh, raised by some market participants uh, about uh, the impact that they might have on the quality of equity market. Uh, in this study, we combine these two concepts and aim to analyze the impact of HFT dealer platforms on market quality, in particular liquidity, their liquidity supply of public exchanges and their inventory management behaviors. The empirical setting for the study is the Swedish stock market in the year 2018, and we also have access to the detailed data to be able to conduct the analysis. For the result, what we find here is that HFT dealer volume is detrimental to exchanges liquidity. If you look at this uh, table here that we have, the three measures of liquidity, what we find here is that one standard deviation increase in HFT dealers' market share reduces the depth at the best code by 11%, increases quoted spread by around 3%, and the transaction cost, which is represented by effective spread by 1.5%. The channel for this liquidity effect is what we analyze in the second bullet point here, here HFT's liquidity supply uh, on public exchanges. What we find here is that on the stock days that HFT has 
trading activities on their own dealer platforms. They reduce their liquidity supply on uh, public exchanges. And the reason for this decision that we argue that is either providing liquidity on their own dealer platforms uh, as they can uh, engage in less risky interactions due to the bilateral nature of trading in dealer platforms since they know who they are trading with. And the other reason is uh, to manage the inventory costs. In fact, to reduce their inventory imbalances as a result of their dealer trades, they can offload their dealer position on exchanges by trading aggressively or taking liquidity on exchange and instead reducing their liquidity supply. The consequence of uh, such a trading uh, strategy by HFT dealers uh, led to what we observe here in the result that is the reduction in the liquidity of uh, public, ex uh, public exchanges for all market participants. And this was a very short presentation of the paper. Thank you. For Thank you time. very much, Fatima. <laughs> it's quite on time and uh, more discussions will be available later. Meanwhile, let me hand over to Dion Bongartz from Rotterdam for the next five minute pitch. Please Dion, the screen is yours for five minutes and just. Okay, thanks. Uh, so in this paper, we uh, set out to identify uh, informed trading. Um, and informed trading is uh, relevant in many applications, uh, many studies uh, in finance. And a classic paper in this literature is the Kyle 1985 paper, where an informed trader strategically trades inversely proportional to the uh, expected price impact. Now you would like to, to take that result from Kyle and use it on market aggregate data to kind of back out uh, what information behind trading was to get an exposed measure of informed trading. But due to uh, noise trading, that is empirically hard to do. Uh, what we do in this paper is develop a method to still achieve that uh, goal. It's model-based uh, <clears throat> and the measure we develop uh, we empirically validate. So what we do in a model is um, that we have uh, traders that get, uh, uh, that get information shocks and liquidity shocks. And we derive optimal uh, demand for securities from them. We derive optimal order flow. Now that order flow uh, contains in part speculative order flow and in part uh, order flow to address their liquidity sh uh, shock. On top of that, they're subject to a budget constraint. So they also, if they need to buy uh, stocks for speculation, they will also need to sell something else. So there's also a funding flow component. We derive optimal order flow in closed form <clears throat> and then apply a trick uh, by assuming that there's one security for which there's never any informed trading to uh, get a very simple uh, and manageable expression for what the underlying uh, average signal in the market uh, was for, uh, for informed trading. Uh, that expression uh, is on this slide. It's written in matrix uh, vector notation where uh, the dimension of the vector is the number of stocks. Uh, and it's for each stock equal to two times the price impact times the aggregate order flow in that stock minus that of this uh, information uh, free security. And the idea behind this is that if you really badly want to trade in a stock with a lot of price impact, you must have a pretty good uh, reason to do so. You must have really good information. So it's a revealed preference based uh, <clears throat> interpretation there. Uh, <clears throat> we operationalize uh, this measure empirically uh, and then test does this really capture uh, informed trading. We see that it lines up with uh, reason uh, reasonable suspects proxies 
for informed trading. So we find it on average to be larger for small firms or firms with more analysts version. Very importantly, we also find that our um, measure of informed trading to today predicts lower reversal tomorrow, indicating that it really picks up information because price impact is then permanent. Um, we do a few other things. Uh, we look around uh, mergers and acquisition announcements uh, and see that our measure of informed trading lines up with pre-event uh, uh, target cars uh, for mergers that show run up. Uh, also indicating that this picks up uh, informed trading. Uh, <clears throat> another thing that we do is uh, we look uh, at uh, stocks that lose analyst coverage. You would expect more informed trading when there's fewer analysts because there's more information asymmetry. Uh, and we indeed uh, find some evidence for that. Of course, in all our uh, analysis, we need to control for, uh, <clears throat> for a lot of alternative explanations to really show that the effect is because of our measure of informed trading and not because of something else that's correlated uh, with it. So we also control uh, for other liquidity measures, uh, PIN, VPIN, other, uh, uh, measures in the literature uh, about uh, in, informed trading. So with that, I would uh, like to invite you to uh, come to my poster session. I hope to see you there. Thanks. Thank you very much, uh, Dion. Uh, perfectly timed as well. So let's uh, hand over to uh, Yang Liu. Uh, for the next five minute pitch. Please, Young, the screen is yours. Can you stop sharing, Dion? Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Oh, thank you, Michelle. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Yang Liu from Tsinghua University. Uh, first, thanks a lot for having our paper. Uh, today, I'm going to present the paper Maximizing the Sharp Ratio, a Genetic Programming Approach. Uh, it's a joint work with Guo Fu Zhou from WashU and Institute from Tsinghua University. Uh, well, as we all know, uh, machine learning uh, revolutionized the research in almost all science. Uh, in finance, the application of machine learning seems to concentrate in estimating the cross-section of stock returns. Uh, in particular, Ooh, Kelly and Xiu have an RSS paper, RFS paper, and they apply a comprehensive set of machine learning tools, and they show that the new, uh, new method indeed dominates the conventional approach. Um, um, an interesting observation of the, uh, about the existing literature is that, on the one hand, the model used in this work uh, are basically based on the conventional objective from the machine learning literature, such as uh, minimizing the misguided error, MSE. On the other hand, however, to evaluate the economic significance, most studies just examine the performance of the well-known spread portfolio. Hence, a natural question is that whether we can apply existing learning tools to directly maximize uh, the op uh, economic objective function. So this is exactly what we do in this paper. So in this paper, we incorporate an, an economic objective by directly optimize the sharp ratio of the euro long short spread portfolio. In specific, suppose X is a stock's characteristics and here capital G is a function mapping from stock characteristics X to the expected return GX. Then sorting stocks by GX, we can construct the euro spread, uh, spread portfolio. And our objective is to find an optimal function capital G to maximize the sharp ratio of the resulting spread portfolio. And to uh, solve the valve uh, optimization problem, we use genetic programming, which is a supervised machine learning method based on the principle of Darwinian's natural evolution. And because of the time limits, I will just skip the model details. And now let's move to the main results. So 
The characteristic set in the empirical uh, work consists of uh, 15 variables, that is size, short-term reversal, momentum, long-term reversal, and we also include uh, 11 moving average signals. And the out-of-sample uh, out of, out of covers a period of about uh, 30 years. So uh, this table shows the out-of-sample of different models, and the first corner shows the results for our GP model. And uh, the can, can, uh, these are some linear model, and the last five columns show the results for the neural network. Uh, we can see that uh, our, our model earns the highest uh, uh, sharp ratio of about 1.3, almost doubling that of the linear models. Uh, also, it earns the highest return of 1.7%. Uh, in particular, uh, the GP model outperforms. Uh, the neural network in terms of both return and sharp ratio. And panel B and pan panel B and panel C shows the uh, performance in the subsamples. In particular, panel C shows that in the most recent subsample, all the linear models fails to produce significant returns, and the neural network also only generate marginal predictability. On the contrary, our model still earns a significant return. And this table further compares our model with others. Uh, in table A, we control for other models, and we can see that GP uh, still produce highly significant returns. These results indicate that uh, GP can have some unique predictability which cannot be replaced by any of other models. Um, conversely, in panel B, controlling for GP, none of other models can produce significant returns. And these results suggest that the predictability of other models uh, are kind of subsumed by the GP model. So uh, I think I will stop here. And if you have any comments or questions, we can discuss it in the next session. OK, thank you. That's exactly right. Thank you, Yang. So amazing discipline so far among the presenters. So the next one is uh, Kuntara Puktuan Tong. I hope I didn't hurt your last name too much. Please, you have five minutes. Don't worry. <laughs> um, all right. Thank you so much for inviting uh, us to present the paper. Today, I will present a joint work with Zhang Lushen and Lucien Wang from University of Missouri. I am from the Missou as well. And our title is Asset Pricing with Daily Shoppers Spending. Daily shoppers spending. So I will start with motivation. Our research question is, can consumption risk explain the equity premium well? Cochrane 2005 said that any other macro finance is not an alternative to the consumption cap M, but just a special case. Consumption has to be a single factor that subsume all other factors. And the riskiness of, all, of any asset should be related with the co-variation with the consumption growth. Um, so far, CAPM has not been successful. One of the reasons is due to data deficiency that is plagued by low variation, not being real consumption, time aggregation bias, and measurement error. So we need the data that has similar frequency and variation to stock return. When a time series has low variation, autocorrelation tend to be too high. High autocorrelation cause standard estimator to underestimate the, the true variance and misestimate the covariance. That caused the risk aversion to be very high to compensate for low covariance between consumption growth and excess stock return. And that is called equity premium puzzle. So far, the literature proposes quite a few measures that try to solve this problem including Savoy garbage data that try to capture true consumption and Cronkey 2017 unfiltered consumption that try to avoid measurement error from filtering and time aggregation. Even so, the estimated list aversion from this paper is still very really high. It's about um, 18 to um, 57, which is higher than Mera and Prescott recommendation of 10. There is a new study by Clybergen and Jan last year 
uh, Journal of Finance criticized that the extent measure of consumption growth are unreliable. They have low correlation with the stock return and, and they have short term series. Um, both of them developed two tests considering these two issues and we are the only consumption measure that passed that test. Um, many researchers also try to solve this problem using factor mimicking portfolio, but fact FMP is not clean either because it, it depends on the methodology and the best asset, which are still inconclusive. Kybergen and Sand 2018 also criticized that most underlying asset of FMP has measurement error. And as a result, the result from FM, F, FMP is not reliable. So what do we do in this paper? We propose a remedy. We, we come up with a new measure. We propose a new measure of consumption growth that is based on true consumption at real time when consumers spend their wealth each day. It had the same variation as stock return. Our measure exploit full information at, on the daily basis, whereas most consumption growth um, is at a quarterly or annual. Our data can match with the daily stock return, so we have more time observation that we can use with more testing assets. As a result, our test should be more powerful and reliable. So our data, because it is based on real consumption, it is more clean, it's not bleached by cleaning process, so it should have low measurement error. Not only that, our data allow us to track product with different storage, time, and also service. Methodology, we apply GMM to estimate risk aversion and risk fee rate, and we perform two-step pharma Macbeth regression to, to see the cross-sectional regression result to estimate beta and risk premium. We include um, testing asset uh, that uh, portfolio and also individual stocks. Our data is daily, so we can uh, we come up with the dynamic hedging strategy to hedge consumption risk every month rather than a year to gain better economic insight. We show that which product uh, we should buy or sell to hedge consumption risk. Okay, go. Let's go to the result. First of all, we show that under. Um, let's look at the right panel. Our measure has highest covariance with the market access return and standard deviation. It just on the left hand side. GMM, we show that our measure generate the lowest risk aversion and risk fee rate compared to the other consumption measure. In terms of cross-sectional regression, our measure generates significant beta and demand significant risk premium, which is consistent with the theory. And the last one, we show that we are the only measure that passed Clibergen and Sand 2020 test. So thank you. Thank you for, for listening and inviting us. Thank you very much, Kuntara, for definitely picking our interest about shopper <laughs> data. Uh, and, but first, uh, let's move on to Maximilian Voigt from Frankfurt for the next five minute pitch of his paper. It can, can you hear me and see the screen? All works. You're great, great, thank you. Many thanks for including me um, on this on the session. Um, it's a great pleasure for me to present my paper on learning and strategic trading in ETF markets um, to you today. Um, so, I, oh, that's not. so as we as we probably all know, um, ETFs are an, becoming increasingly popular phenomenon in financial markets, and the number of ETFs is actually increasing each and every year. So, although there was already a pretty high number back in 2019 it increased by about 9% to 2020. And ETFs add an additional kind of information to financial markets. So already, um, if, if you think about it on a first glance, they at least provide some, some kind of mixed signal about the value of the underlying assets. And what I'm going to analyze in, this, in, in my paper is um, how does this signal and this new information affect the behavior of informed strategic traders? And I do so in a, in a relatively standard Kyle model um, where I compare a model without an ETF market with a model with an ETF market. And let me quickly guide you through it. Um, so as a baseline model, I use a two period Kyle model um, where I have two assets, so asset A and asset B. 
which are which are traded by by speculators and noise traders. And there are two speculators, insider A, who learns the value of asset A, and insider B, who learns the value of asset B. And then in the first trading period, um, the insiders submit a market order, and noise traders also submit a market order. And this aggregate order flow is observed by market makers who set um, semi-strong form information efficient prices. Um, after this trading period, at an interim period, um, everyone in the market can observe the prices and they would observe the order flows. And they can potentially learn from this order flow something new about the value of the assets and update their expectation and, and might update their, their prices. And then there's a second trading period which works exactly as the first one. So for this, for this benchmark model, I assume that the two assets, asset A and asset B, are fundamentally independent. So their asset values are not correlated, which means that the variance covariance matrix of the economy is diagonal. And this actually has the natural consequence that these two asset markets are fragmented. So insider A will only be trading in asset market A and not in asset market B. And at this interim period, no one is actually learning anything. This crucially changes once I introduce an ETF on top of this market. So keeping the asset market as it was previously, I, I introduce an ETF that's combining the two assets, asset A and asset B, um, and the two markets, so the asset market and the ETF market are fragmented, which means that um, traders can either trade the ETF or the assets, but not both. Um, other than that, the ETF market replicates the setting of the underlying asset market. So I have two insiders who learn the value of one, but not the other asset. Um, I have noise traders and market makers and the trading proceeds exactly as in the asset market. But what changes is that the, that the variance covariance matrix of the asset payoffs in this new economy is no longer diagonal. And therefore, there's an additional learning opportunity at the entry period. So if you think about um, the market maker who's pricing asset A, then he can now observe the, uh, the price of the ETF. And if this price is, is very high and asset A is included in this ETF, um, it's actually highly likely that the value of asset A is, is also um, high. And therefore, you might um, update his price quote at this entry period. But um, in addition to the, uh, to the market makers, also the speculators can inform some updating and, and learning. And if you would think about um, speculator B, who knows the value of asset B perfectly, for him, the um, ETF price is only informative, provides only a signal about the value of asset A. And this signal is much more precise than the signal of the, of the market maker. And therefore, he gains an informational advantage and starts trading in the market about which he was not previously informed in the second period. And this is this kind of a, a, an expected consequence. But what is more surprising is that already in the first period, as um, speculator B, who is informed about asset B and knows nothing about asset A, starts trading in asset market A. And he does so to increase his future informational advantage, which I call manipulative trading. Um, and therefore, um, my, my paper shows um, that introducing an ETF into an economy actually makes the economy fundamentally interconnected, which leads to cross-asset learning, even if the, price, if the assets are fundamentally unrelated, and to trading across assets for manipulative and for informational reason. And therefore, this, this cross-asset activity actually induces an excessive co-movement of the prices of the assets. So even if the assets are not correlated, their values are totally independent, um, the prices will be correlated. And this has dichotomous effects on, on price informativeness. So short-run price informativeness is actually worsened because of the manipulative order, which induces additional noise, while long-run price informativeness is actually improved due to additional learning opportunities. With this um, short picture, actually, I actually end, and I hope to see you in my breakout session. Many thanks for listening. Thank you very much, uh, Maximilian. Great timing as well. And uh, now, last but not least, let's turn over to Hang Wang from University of New South Wales. First of all, thank you for staying up late to join the conference. And uh, you have five minutes. OK, thanks. So uh, hello everyone, so my name is Han Wang. So thanks for having me here. So now I'm going to present my paper, not only on a seamless response news, why is stimulus priced? So in this paper, I provide a new, new explanation for the price of stimulus by accounting for inter intersectionality in stimulus. So um, many papers show that stop, the return stimulus is negatively priced in the cross-section. Here the stimulus just means the third moment of returns, so it's from level stimulus. So this paper typically argue that uh, the price of stimulus transform is not like a feature. 
right? So not only preference investors, they will over demand on the stocks with more positive stimulus, and therefore these stocks have no future returns. So these people typically assume that the stimulus is an exogenous characteristic. So in other words, they do not address the important question of whether return stimulus is an endogenous feature. That is, they do not consider what general stimulus to begin with. So the question in my paper is, by understanding the nature of stimulus, can this help us better understand the negative pricing of stimulus? So by answering this question, I can make contributions that I can have a new explanation for the price of students. And this novel explanation emphasizes that according for internationality students is important for understanding the pricing of students. So now about my new explanation. So again, my new explanation is based on what generally students to begin with. So many evidence show that uh, uh, investors a symmetrical response to news can uh, generally, generally to the students in the first place. Right? So I call this a seamless response to news as news discussion in my paper. So this evidence is, is very intuitive right? because we know the students called a seamless in returns or a seamless opportunity. So it's upside to downside and return of hidden ratio. If the upside return, uh, if upside return opportunity is not equal to downside return opportunity, we also see the variation in students. Right? For example, if an investor then react more to bad news than good news, right? so a seamless report news. In this case, we have a greater downside opportunity than upside opportunity. So of course, in this case, we've seen the students is relatively low or more negative. Right? So and we know that at the same time, this national to news also creates this pricing. Right? So similarly, if investor react, react more to, to bad news, so we create under pricing. But if they react more to good news, we create, create over price. So taking these two together, so misdirection to news can generate the skewness and create this price simultaneously. Therefore, stocks with high skewness will be relatively overpriced because about investors react more to good news. Right? And the stocks with more uh, negative skewness, skewness will be relatively underpriced because about uh, investors react more to bad news. Right? So by this simple mechanism, we can observe a negative pricing of skewness. So in this paper, I argue that the price of students comes from in investors a symmetrical response to use. So my paper is based on the argument that students arises due, due to mispricing. However, the existing paper argues students creates mispricing. That's the key difference between my paper and the existing papers. So here's my simple methodology. I just decompose daily stock returns into new state and non new state returns. And then I compute the, the realness skewness for both of these state types. So skewness is just computed by taking the third moment of returns over the past four quarters. Now I use the new state returns to capture investor reaction to news. Therefore, the skewness computed from new state returns is more likely to capture investors a symmetric response to news. So the preliminary result here is that the only the skewness computed from observed new state returns is negatively pressed in the cross section. And I call this as a skewness effect in my paper. Now, so these results confirm that the skewness, which is about reaction to news, is pressed in the cross section. So consistent with my explanation that the price of skewness comes from news reactions. So the next is to confirm whether this skewness effect comes from investors a symmetric response to news. Right. So first, I confirm that investors react to news asymmetrically in my sample, and then these asymmetric news reactions create this price in my sample. So these results are confirmed with my key assumption in the paper. Right. And then I find that the skew news effect only exists among stocks that uh, experiencing a symmetric reaction to news. Right. So all these results confirm that investors asymmetric reaction to news is the underlying source of the price of skew news. Right. And up to now, all these results are based on the real nice skew news. So the next question is, random explanation can help us under, better understand the pricing of expected skill needs. Right? So the answer here is yes, because my explanation produces a positive correlation between current skill needs and the current returns. In other words, it also produces a positive correlation between future skill needs and future returns. Right? So therefore, under my explanation, we, we can observe the positive price of the expected skill needs. Right? If, if, if an investor expects to react more to good news, we can expect in the future uh, expect good, uh, the positive expect goodness and also the positive future returns. Right? So as predict, I find that the expect goodness is positively priced among stocks whose goodness is more likely to capture a seamless national to news. Right? So overall, my results, my expectation, and my results here uh, suggest that the accounting for internationality is goodness that right, can help us better understand the pricing of the both real nice and the expect goodness. Right? And finally, I find that other explanations cannot explain my results. Right? So that's all for my presentation. And thanks for listening. Any questions, I will come later on.
So yes, thank you very much, Hank, and also uh, thank you very much to the previous uh, five presenters for very efficiently uh, delivering their short pitches. I think they should all have encouraged you to, to find out more about, uh, about their papers.